transport him from the city jail to the county jail. And so they were going to do it in an armored truck. At the last minute, they decided they would use this as a decoy. They were going to bring an unmarked police car into the basement, put him in that, transport him. This car would pull out. The press would follow that, and they would take him without press uh, following their car to the county jail. Jack Ruby was about 350 feet away at the Western Union, wiring some money to someone, and uh, he apparently walked down this ramp into the basement and got there about three minutes before Oswald is brought out. Oswald's cuffed to um, patrolman detective um, uh, level, and he still at this point has not seen um, Jack Ruby. Uh, he's pulled a 38 snub nose revolver, and then he sees him, and he turns quickly like this, and this was the fatal shot, single shot, unusual to kill someone with a single pistol shot, most of the time you will live. But when Oswald turned, he did significant vascular damage uh, to his uh, back behind his stomach area. He was shot in the left chest, diaphragm, spleen, blew the superior mesenteric artery off the aorta, which is the main artery out of the heart, went through and through the inferior vena cava, the huge vein that goes with all the blood from the lower extremities and abdomen back to the heart, and then damaged, uh, went through the uh, pancreas and the liver and the right kidney. Um, this is uh, uh, James Level, uh, when Mrs. Tippett was honored recently. And uh, I just, uh, this which mentions that I was in the emergency room, was called in the emergency room when Oswald came. What happened was I'd been out uh, staffing a stab wound to the neck and was in the lounge in the operating room and the phone rang and a nurse answered it and quickly turned to me and said, Oswald's been shot and they're bringing him out. Uh, I knew that Dr. Perry and Dr. Uh, Jenkins were in an office just uh, nearby, so I went up and told them that uh, Oswald had been shot. Uh, we tried to call Dr. Shire's chief of surgery. He was not at home. He subsequently heard it on the radio and turned around and came back. And uh, so this is about the way Oswald looked. This picture was taken, I think, when he was still in jail. Uh, but uh, this is the way he looked as he was wheeled into trauma room two, the same room that Connolly was in. I saw about the same thing. I list did listen to his heart, and he did have a heartbeat. He had no blood pressure. But uh, we needed to get an IV going. Dr. Jenkins had already brought an anesthesia machine. We were in the ER but the, before Oswald was rolled in, just a minute or so, and uh, did the same thing. I put a cut down in the left upper arm, got an IV going, and then did put a chest tube in his left chest because he had, had a, a, been shot in the chest. And we had him to surgery uh, within about 10 minutes after he came to the emergency room. He uh, lived for about an hour. and. Um, 20 or 30 minutes, and was pronounced uh, dead at um, 107. And this is Dr. Shires, the chief of surgery then. Uh, and uh, this is the operating record showing Dr. Shires was the surgeon, Dr. Perry's first assistant, McClellan's second, and I was the, the third assistant holding a retractor up in the right upper part of the abdomen. He lost um, about uh, 16 uh, units of blood. We estimated 8,300. We replaced 16 units of blood and he never regained uh, consciousness. This is an autopsy picture. This gunshot wound to the left chest has been cored out. That's the IV that I started, and his chest tube's been inserted up here. Uh, so he was slain uh, in Dallas. This is the Fort Worth Star uh, telegram. And uh, this lists some of the doctors, but the main thing of this is that Parkland did become a fortress. You can see police on each level and uh, Connolly's room was on two east, and they put metal shields over the windows and had three rooms lined up with doors so that he could move from one room to the other because they weren't sure, uh, as you said, what was happening either in Washington or in Dallas, and they wanted to protect him. Um, <clears throat> Jack uh, Rubenstein was, was arrested and um, was uh, placed in jail. He ran the Carousel Club here in Dallas on Commerce Street and uh, frequently served the police coffee. They frequented his carousel. He frequented the police station. So they didn't think much about it the night before. Um, he was never officially uh, connected with uh, the mob, although he had rather a, 
a uh, significant history and with I, I said that he may have only had about an eighth grade uh, uh, education uh, most of the stores in Dallas closed uh, that uh, following day Monday was set aside as uh, as a day of mourning and people came from all over the world uh, to uh, Kennedy's uh, funeral uh, this is um, Charles de Gaulle Ali Selassie many prime ministers Ms. Kennedy led the um, funeral procession from the White House to St. Matthew's Roman Cathedral. And uh, I was uh, spoken to by the Secret Service in January. This happened in November. The Warren Commission had been appointed six days after the assassination, and they made the head of the uh, Supreme Court uh, the chairman of that, who happened to be Earl Warren, and therefore is the Warren Commission. Uh, Gerald Ford was on it, and uh, uh, Mr. Rankin was the chief counsel. And uh, then in February, after the Secret Service had talked to me once about did I have any other hand scribbled notes that I hadn't turned in, uh, I got a subpoena. And that was to possibly testify at Jack Ruby's trial. Uh, this was in one of the papers, the next, uh, this Dallas Times Herald. And this is me with a crew cut and Dr. Carr. Uh, Mr. Landgren, who was a, the administrator, and that's Dr. Shires. And Arlen Specter was the one that interrogated me for the Warren Commission. He was the one that came up with a single bullet theory. And uh, he, one of the things he asked me uh, was, did I have any experience with gunshot wounds? And I said, well, yes. He said, uh, uh, are you a ballistics expert? And I said, no, but we've seen a lot of gunshot wounds. And uh, he said, uh, um, have you ever seen someone shot at 265.5 feet with a rifle, 6.5 millimeter, with a muzzle velocity of 2,000 feet per second, striking someone in the back, not hitting any bone and soft tissue, and then striking another individual. And I said, well, no. And uh, he said, um, uh, and, and so some of the questions were, were obvious that I would have to say no on. The next year, I looked up what our experience was. I knew I'd, I told him I'd seen 160 or 200 probably, but not a lot of rifle wounds. I looked up and we had seen 1,271 the next year. Uh, and had admitted 515, so we were seeing two, three, four gunshot wounds a day. But they were smaller caliber than, than now. We don't see AK-40. We didn't see AK-45s in these machine gun type uh, missiles uh, then. This is the pristine bullet. As you recall, uh, Connolly uh, was supposedly shot by the same uh, bullet, and uh, <clears throat> he, this bullet was found on his stretcher. He's shot in the limo, he's placed on a cart, taken into the emergency room, fully clothed with a suit on. The suit is removed. Dr. Duke took care of his chest wound, put in a chest tube, put a gown on him, put sheets on him. He's examined. The wounds are identified as the chest, the wrist, and the thigh. No bullet is seen. And he's taken upstairs to the operating room, placed on the operating room table. The sheets are removed, placed back on the cart. The cart comes down, placed in front of the restroom, Someone uses the restroom, comes out and move, move the cart, and notices this bullet on the cart. So all of that transpired. Did it, was it on his clothes? Did it fall onto the cart? Nobody found it during all that examination, and somehow it stayed on there? I don't know. Uh, that's what was determined, and I have nothing to refute it. Now, it's really not pristine. The nose is pristine, but if you looked at the base of the bullet, it's significantly uh, damaged over here. And uh, the FBI has done some experiments, squeezing the bullet, scooping out the base of it, and you could get a couple of grains out, which is more than enough to account for the, what was found in Kennedy's skull, Connolly's wrist, and thigh. Well, what did we learn out of all this? And about to wind up here. Um, number one, I couldn't get a line out with the Secret Service and the FBI, so we thought it'd be nice to have a phone, a hotline, where we could call out, but nobody could call in. So that was implemented at that time. We wrote a book on the care of the trauma patient, not on Kennedy, but on management of gunshot wounds, stab wounds, and automobile accidents, and published that a year or two after the assassination. We applied to the NIH for a four-unit shock trauma 
to study uh, primarily fluids and electrolytes, and we were funded and we opened that. And then in 1969 about, uh, Wes Wise appointed the Greater Dallas League of Municipalities, and in it he said that we needed an ambulance service. Um, we tried to do this on a county basis. Highland Park was included, uh, among others. There were about uh, 35 municipalities in Dallas County at the time. We tried to get it countywide, and most of the municipalities rejected it. They said, Dallas is going to be the recipient of this. And so I have letters from all the mayors saying we're not in it. So I was made medical director to help implement the, the ambulance service that we have now in conjunction with Captain Bill Roberts of the fire department. We decided to turn it over to the fire department. And so we went with Dallas. And now, as you know, most of the municipalities have, have come around, and they have their own ambulance services. But with the conjunction with the Department of Transportation, this ambulance uh, was designed. Prior to that, patients were transported by a hearse or by a station wagon. No one had ever ridden in the back with a patient. And here's some of the staff. This is Dr. Perry, deceased. He was the one that was the primary surgeon for President Kennedy. This is Dr. Shires, deceased. Here I am. This is Dr. McClellan, still alive. He held a retractor while they were doing a tracheotomy. This is Dr. Baxter, who helped Dr. Perry with the tracheotomy. He's deceased. This is Dr. Carrico, who was attempting to intubate the president. He's deceased. And Dr. Crenshaw, who wrote the book con about conspiracy and the assassination, and he also is deceased. Um, close with these slides. This was a picture I took uh, about six uh, months after the assassination. I was at chief residence meeting at the Airlie House in Warrington, Virginia, which was where Eisenhower's retreat was uh, when he was president. And I came back at the National Cemetery and, and took this photo. I wanted to see the uh, eternal uh, flame. And um, I've said before that these people uh, were walking by and I didn't know who they were and they didn't know who I was. Thank you all. All of us have varying opinions about what happened, and at this time we could share some questions, and if you do have opinions, save those for private conversation, but if you have any general questions, let me just add one thing to what uh, Ron had to say. Oswald would be alive if it were not for the press. It was the press that killed Oswald. You had a feeding frenzy. You had four to 500 reporters there, and as Ron showed you, you had the footage in, in the police station. It will never happen again. Here's the prisoner coming down the hall, and there's a camera and a mic right in front of his face. It should not have happened. You had people demanding to see Oswald, demanding to have a press conference, and so at the last minute, literally the night before, Jess Curry, chief of police, made a bad call. And he said, you remember uh, Oswald had the little, you know, nick on him from, from the uh, scuffle in the Texas theater. And Curry said, we have the press of the world here and they want to see how we have treated this prisoner. And he decided to do the photo op, to do the public transfer. And Jim Lavelle and Will Fritz and everybody else said, don't do that. It was going to be a decoy, as Ron said. If you're going to say you're going to move him at 10, move him at 9, don't do this. And Curry was trying to cooperate with the press. So Crazy Jack came in at the last minute on that public transfer, and the rest is a history. It's when the truth died with Oswald. That was the press. Uh, questions? for Ron or myself. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, is that we carry the light? Yes, yes, sir. All right.
I may have read this wrong on the drug report today, they had an interview with a, a nurse who was 28 at the time, and she was in the trunk room <coughs> one at the head of uh, Kennedy, and she said she found an undamaged bullet uh, right below his ear. I was wondering if you had any comment. Uh, I'm not aware of that, and I don't think it's in the uh, Warren uh, report that a bullet was found. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the entrance and exit wound, and, and one of the things our inspector asked me was, if, if I thought this was an entrance wound and now it's an exit wound, how could I explain it being an exit wound? And I said, well, maybe the bullet just was just barely made it through the skin, but the bullet was not found presumably on Kennedy's card. It was found on on Connolly's cart, so uh, I've heard that uh, statement, but so far as I know, uh, it's, it's not reported in the Warren Commission, and, and none of us were told that there was a, a bullet found there. Yes, sir. Now, when the President traveled with advanced preparations, they asked to uh, prepare the medical team for potential disasters, set aside an operating room, set aside a staff. Was there uh, any advanced preparation for Trevor One to be ready for this kind of? Okay, the, the question is, were we notified in advance that the, pres that the president would be brought to Parkland, should it? No, this in advance of the visit, did they make arrangements to they have you all ready in case there was a disaster at this time? I'm sorry, advance I can't hear you. Well, you don't come up here at the mic and ask it because we're having a little trouble here across the room. I don't project very well, I'm sick. <laughs> My understanding is that when the president travels these days, they make advanced preparations. Oh, okay. Does, it, does it advance okay. part? These days, okay. Yeah. yeah. Was there anything like that done in advance? No. no. We were not told in advance that the president, if if something happened, we had no indication of anything till I answered the phone. Nowadays, you're correct. Uh, they do have um, notification of the hospital, and not only for the president, but for any presidential candidate or dignitary, and they require staff in the hospital 24 hours a day if, if need be, uh, including neurosurgeons. So it is now. When the, uh, when the limo left, we didn't know where he was going. We had no idea. Uh, nothing about, you know, parking or whatever. Hang on, was there a hand over here? Or is that, yes sir, I'm sorry, thank you. Would you stand, please? Sure, sure. Is the, uh, the trauma room, of course, Parkland Hospital's been uh, modernized and uh, there's some renovations. Is, the, is that trauma room still there or has it no. been? Uh, and what's going to happen when the new Parkland opens up? What's going to happen in that room? Well, the room is not there. It was uh, taken down several years ago. Radiology department took it over. It was disassembled and um, for a while was kept in Fort Worth. It's now underground in, uh, was it Lexana, Kansas, in a warehouse type thing, concrete, heavy concrete. It's not available for uh, public uh, viewing, but the content in the trauma room one is still around, but it's, it's in Kansas. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, clothing, of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy's in the National Archives. The limousine is in the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And sold for $160,000. <laughs> Ruby, I mean, it's all been, uh, yes ma'am. Did Marina Oswald come to the hospital when her husband was brought there? You want to, that's Bob Schieffer. Uh, Marina Oswald, you want to do it? Since no, you're <laughs> You're referring to Mrs. Oswald uh, being brought. She didn't come to the hospital. She, she went to the uh, jail where her son was, and Bob Schieffer was a, is that what you're asking me? Well, his wife, did she come to Oh, the Marina, Marina. I was talking, I thought you meant Margaret. No. Uh, Marina did not come. No. Uh, Marina is still alive. The kids are still alive. Robert, the brother, is in uh, Wichita Falls. Robert wrote a book about Lee. Uh, he was allowed to see him uh, in the interrogation room for a few minutes. Lee never did admit. He didn't admit to the arresting officers at the Texas Theater. He never admitted to Will Fritz. He never admitted to his brother that he did it, much less the reason. One of the 
quotes in, at the conclusion of uh, Robert's book about his brother was, what devil of devils possessed this brother of mine? So no one will ever know that. Let me just uh, close with one observation. No one mentioned conspiracy theories, and we've had all of them except, I guess, a UFO. And if you wanted to start a conspiracy theory tonight, you just flip on your iPhone and post it, and by the time you get home, there will be thousands supporting the new theory. A good friend of mine, Hugh Ainsworth, has spent about 40 years tracing every conspiracy theory they don't work. There are a couple of books out now criticizing the Warren Commission, and I met with the staff of the Warren Commission when they were here for a symposium, and they will admit, for instance, uh, Arlen Specter was, was supposed to question Jackie Kennedy, but Bobby Kennedy was being very protective, and instead she was questioned by one of the staff people, and Specter felt being a former prosecutor, he would have had more questions, and it's probably true. So there will be books out criticizing the methodology of the Warren Commission, maybe some slippage here and there, but no one, no one has come up with any conclusive evidence to change the conclusion. Now, it's very difficult for any of us in Dallas, internationally, anywhere, to accept that someone so inconsequential, so insignificant as a Lee Harvey Oswald could accomplish something as monumental, as world-changing, as killing a president of the United States in broad daylight by himself. And thus, conspiracy theories abound. But the story of those three days has not changed. One man, one gun, three shots, one life. Thank you for coming. We have our chairman of our board, Mike Tibbles, to make a presentation to our guests, a token of our appreciation. On behalf of P-CHIPS, we thank you, Dr. Jones and Pierce, very much. It's unique to have a first-hand uh, account of such an historic event, and we're very privileged and uh, happy that the historic, we're not only a, a preservation society, but a, an historical society. And we're very pleased to have had this presentation tonight. And Linda Lund, thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you.